So, yeah, like I said, I just did a brief introduction. Um, I'll just do a really quick one again. Um, we used to do these at, you know, I'm, I'm the operations manager at, at um, a &H Maitland. Um, I worked with Becky, started working with Becky for about, uh, about seven years ago when I started doing the installs there, the art installs in the gallery and the museum. Um, my background is I'm, an, I'm a, a, a painter. Uh, I do multimedia work as well, some video installations. My, um, I got my uh, BFA from School of Visual Arts in Manhattan in 1988. I don't want to date myself, but 1988. And then I got my master's from Stony Brook University in 2012. Uh, I worked at Christie's Auction House as the lighting and visual coordinator for six years. And I um, also taught at Stony Brook University as an adjunct for two years. So that was right before I came down to relocated to, to Maitland to, uh, I actually live in Winter Springs, but right outside of Maitland. So, um, we, we really, at Maitland, we really look forward to these casual kind of intimate conversations with artists. We think it's really important, especially because we, um, we've all felt so ridiculously isolated lately. You know, we, we're kind of like in this weird dream state that we're all in. And um, when Danielle and, and our new co-directors, um, Danielle Thomas and Randall Webster suggested we do this again, I was really happy that uh, Stephanie and Kit volunteered to have their work looked at. It's not an easy thing, especially in Zoom, right? It's kind of like you can feel kind of unnerved because you it's a beautiful thing when you can see somebody's artwork in, in you know when you're in a room with it. And sometimes you can worry about how it's representing online or something like that, but we're just gonna go through that and uh, we'll come out the other side and I'm sure we'll walk away with something from this. And and uh, like I said, I, I'm I'm really uh, I have a, the world of respect for Becky. Um, She's a very giving person. She's super committed to A&H and we really appreciate that. And um, I'll let Becky just introduce herself before we get started and tell us some of her credentials there. I'm glad you introduced yourself because I had made notes on you just in case you didn't say anything <laughs> about yourself. So, and I might add that if you are in the museum world and you're a curator or a director, you would want Dan Hess on your team, especially if you were installing or deinstalling or in the middle of a crisis, because he's very calm, cool, collected, and has a lot of good answers and input when you're in the throes of doing a show. Um, I have graduated from the University of South Florida. I have two degrees. One's from the College of Mass Communications, and it's in photojournalism. And the other degree is from the College of Fine Arts, and it is in painting. Uh, my first two jobs outside of college involved taking pictures for the sheriff's office here in Hillsborough County. And I was the medical photographer for the Moffitt Cancer Center. And after a, a good amount of time doing those positions, I decided it was time to get back to my fine art. So I started at the very bottom rung you can be in museum work as the coordinator for club art at the Tampa Museum where I did programs for teenagers on how to use different kinds of media and more or less worked myself up through the system, uh, working in education, working as a registrar, working in curatorial. And then finally, my last position was at a &H as the chief curator over the facilities there. Um, probably my best job, but unfortunately it was a two hour drive from my house. So I spent four hours a day in the car, which was not good. Uh, my personal work revolves around using um, 19th century photographic processes. That includes salt play, uh, prints, collodions, vermoils, hand-painted photos. And uh, most of that I've taught myself, but I have studied at the Eastman House. Most recently, my work is touring Europe with the Polaroid collection. And it was featured in Black and White magazine at the beginning of the COVID. But unfortunately, it got featured in the magazine about the time all the bookstores closed down. So that magazine came onto the shelves and went off the shelves before anyone ever saw it. <laughs> So, but it still counts. Um, so that's basically it. Uh, I love doing this. I love hearing about people and their artwork. Uh, I love having the engaging conversation. Dan mentions that we used to do these in person, which was always a lot better. But what he didn't mention is Dan and I used to always engage in a lot of conversation about different artists and artwork during our installs, because our installs would take about a week, sometimes two weeks, probably more if we were talking about art. Um, and I think it's really important that we, you know, make that connection with other artists and get other opinions. And it was always helpful to have 
Dan to bounce things off of. Um, I encourage other artists to do the same thing, to reach out, you know, get opinions on your work. I think critique is a very bad word to use. Right. Because I, you know, I, I think it kind of has a negative connotation just from, you know, how it's been used in the academic sense. Um, but I do think it's important that we have those conversations with other people so that we can grow as artists. Mm. That's pretty much it in a nutshell. Great. That's all. And, and I just want you to know when we did get online before this with Danielle, Becky and I were both wearing black shirts. <laughs> so because we look like twins, I felt like I had to put on a white one and differentiate myself. And, um, and because I, I'm the, if tonight I'm the good cop, she's the bad cop. That's how you tell us apart, you know? So, um, and I, I did mention before this that we have uh, Matthew Mosher with us, who I'm, I'm happy he's joining us. He's a really accomplished artist. He's a assistant professor at UCF. He's one of our AIAs at Maitland right now. And if you do go to visit Maitland, we have a show up right now called New Work, and it's the work of our um, current AIAs. And Matthew has a couple really brilliant pieces in there that are a, a conversation between art and technology. So we're happy to have him with his, his, his background is making us all look bad, but we'll, we'll go along with that right now. So, um, and we have Danielle Sibley, by the way, she's our education manager and she does a phenomenal job at what she does. So, so listen, I guess we'll just jump right into it. Is it okay, Kit, if we talk about your work first? Sure. Uh, how about you just kind of go in and do a little bit. I, I read your artist statement. Maybe you just want to share a little bit with everybody. And then Danielle has some images of your work she'll put up. And then I think with, because you're mainly photography based, even though we talked today and you, you have some, you have a painting that was just accepted into a, uh, a group show, correct? Correct. Um, if you want to talk about that stuff as well, I, I know we only have images of your photographic work, but um, uh I'm probably going to go first because Becky probably has more that she can speak to as far as your practice than me. And then when we'll, we'll flip it and when we go to talk about Stephanie, Becky will go first and then I'll dovetail on the back of Stephanie's work. Okay. Sounds good. <laughs> Great. So um, photo photography is primary my medium. Um, I've done a lot of painting as well, but I always tend to revert back to photography because we travel a lot. Um, I have a career in the healthcare field as a development officer, and so I'm primarily in fundraising for healthcare organizations. And on the side, I've just been so interested in travel and really learning about the different communities that my husband and I travel to. We do a lot of hiking. Uh, we lived in Alaska for a while in Juneau and in Anchorage, so those represent, are represented in the artwork that you'll see today. Um, really interested in conservation and the stories behind the landscapes. So when I travel, I like to get to know people at diners, at restaurants that we go to, really getting a sense of the art community when I travel. Sometimes I'm able to attend like a local show or go to a smaller concert or really get to know the people behind those um, representations of the art. And I found that to be true really in the Anchorage community more so than anywhere else that we've lived. Um, I felt like it was um, a really good place to show art as well as get to know a little bit about the meaning behind the artwork that was created because people had been traveling there from all over. It's really a melting pot, a lot like Orlando and Central Florida. And I was surprised to find that out because I, I had heard that it's more of a smaller town. But after I lived in Juneau, traveled to Juneau for several years and would stay in remote um, cabins off the shore uh, and in these remote islands. And um, that really drove a lot of the photography that I have done. And two of the pieces that you'll see today was just being reflective, having those moments that were very um, focused around being quiet and being still, having weeks at a time where we wouldn't see anybody go by in a boat. Um, it was just so different from what the normal life of being in a hectic schedule was like and, and very intentional. So I wanted to make sure that I captured that and 
most of my artwork that I do, I have a blog that I started writing a little bit about those travels and posting a little bit online. And then I decided, you know, it's been 20 years since I've done a, a show. It's about time to get back into that. And we spoke a little bit about that earlier today, that the timing just felt right. Coming out of COVID, working remote um, in my primary job really has allowed me to capture back those hours that I was spending on the road driving to and from work because it's an over, over an hour each way. And so I've been able to just really be intentional again about what do I want to do with this? You know, as an introvert, it's a little bit harder um, to put yourself out there. Um, I consider myself a lifelong learner, but it's still, I think, really important to be open to critiques like this and, and feedback. And I think you get some of that when you attend a show or participate in a show because you get support from the community. But it's also good to hear, you know, how did you get developed? You know, how did you Go, grow in your work in creating a body of work? How did you go from just having a few pieces that you felt really proud about and letting go of some of those pieces that maybe weren't as good or polished, but they helped you grow in your skill? And I think that's important to get feedback on those as well. So I, I really feel honored to be included. I'm, I'm glad to be with you this evening and appreciate any feedback. No, oh, that's great. I'm really happy that you, I had a chance for you to talk because some of that stuff wasn't in your artist statement. And mm -hmm. I really, I mean, just the things that I responded to were the elements that weren't in your artist statement. And that's really happens a lot, I think. Um, I know a lot of artists that have a difficulty writing about their own work, you know, in clarity. Matthew's an exception, you know, I've read Matthew's, I had to write about a bunch of artists that were in an, uh, a, a, fundraising auction we had at Maitland and I would have to either rewrite their their things because they they were kind of distant from them their own work so I you know being an outsider and I love writing about art so I would have to rewrite a lot of it Matthew was very I mean all I had to do was cut and paste because he he kind of knew exactly what was going on with his work but it's like yourself um I'm really happy you did mention some things I'm just going to talk briefly and then I'm going to let it get to Becky. Um, and I'll respond to a couple of things you said, but one thing I do want to say is, um, man, it is, it is a crazy, crazy time. I was thinking if I was a photographer, um, I taught a class on uh, called uh, photography for non-majors and it was a, uh, a lecture style class at, at Stony Brook. And, um, and what happened was we, it was about, there was about 50 or 60 people in the class. And um, it was really about the intersection between photography and social media and the effect that social media was having on photography. And what I was kind of playing the devil's advocate because most of the, obviously all the students were younger than I was. But the one thing that I was um, really concerned about was how imagery was becoming disposable especially photo like photographs. Um, you know, I would bring up instances of photography when I was younger that, you know, you'd see an image and that photograph would have a great impact on like national consensus of, you know, either like some foreign policy or, you know, I remember like, you know, talking about the, <clears throat> when I was a kid, very young, I, I saw the, the image of the the young girl running away from the, the burning village, the napalm village in Vietnam. And I remember that one image like caused a, a national um, conversation about what the war was about and all that stuff. But now it's because of social media, you have this, like you have these incredible images, these guys that are doing like landscape photography like yourself. and they're doing this drone photography and the images are like 20 or 30 years ago, the, the images would have been revolutionary. And now we just kind of scroll through them and, and they become almost disposable. And it's really sad. Sometimes I'll actually make myself screenshot an image and I'll force myself to go sit with it because I don't want something that that's um, that amazing to become disposable to me, you know? Mm -hmm. So for me, if I was a, like uh, 
a photographer, I was trying to question when I was looking at your work, like, <clears throat> like, wow, how, how would I approach this massive seismic shift that's happening with, um, with how people regard imagery, you know, like, it's just, um, and I think because of everybody's access, like, not everybody has access to a, a canvas or a painting or, you know, some multimedia thing, but like everybody has a phone with a camera on it now and everybody thinks that their work is great, you know, or that, that's their whole thing is, or they they post it like it's, it's great, whatever. So there's this real kind of, um, I don't know, it's like a, a shifting in the identity of photography. Maybe Becky can spec, you know, speak to this better than I can. But um, the one thing that I'll bring up quickly is when you were talking about going to Flo going to um, Alaska and meeting with these people and interacting on an intimate level with those people, see that would be something that I would really love to see in an image. Does that make sense? Like I don't know. Like what I'm trying to say is, I can only go sometimes. I'm, I'm I'm I do really love listening to artists talk because I feel like I can kind of like I think that intent in work is really important. So I think sometimes that aren't, artists aren't aware until they start talking to somebody else what the real intent of their work is, you know? So like in your artist statement, you know, you, you spoke about these different things that I underlined and this and that, but I, I, I completely forgot about it when you started talking about Alaska because this, this kind of life came out of what you were saying and you were so connected to it and I could hear it in your voice and, and, and that kind of, communicating, um, and I, I'm, not, I'm not kind of running away from the landscape photography yet, but what I'm trying to say is, I think your genuine connection to that artist community and can reflect on, the, on that location just as much as a landscape image. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Like, I, I think that, like sometimes you see these images of people, like when they go and they meet someone or meet some culture because, the one thing you did mention was cultures and you, you talked about environmental issues. A lot of times we can see that in, in, a, in a landscape photograph, but a lot of times we can see it just on the faces of the people that live in that area. You know, these indigenous people or these people that are local to that area. And, um, and just in hearing you talk about your desire to meet these people, because when you did talk about and I'm just going based on what you said and, and the life, the, the excitement that was in your conversation, you spent most of the time talking about meeting these great people, right? Like meeting these artists and meeting these things. But meanwhile, I, I'm just saying, I don't, there's no images that you passed on of that. And, I, and I'm feeling like, oh man, I really wanna see those images because those images to me would be like, you know, like I, I think they would almost honestly convey more of, of what you were trying to get to in your intent. Does that make sense? Like absolutely, bit? that's yeah. right on point. Yeah. So I'm just so I, listen. I'm going to let Becky kind of dovetail on this and now. And like I said, if you came on late, Danielle is going to be fielding questions through the chat. But um, listen, there's there's obviously beautiful elements in your work. There's one Danielle that's like this one with the with the lighting and you know like this one. You know, I, I kind of like the imperfect lighting. There's almost like a, a flare on the one tree and this and that. But, you know, there is a sense of environmental, like the love of the environment, concern for the environment. But I really can't get away from the fact that you were so enamored about your access to these local people and, and the local community and that I almost want to see that. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Uh, okay. Well, listen, I appreciate you letting me talk. I'm going to let Becky just take over. And Thank you. Hey, Kit. Um, yeah, I have to agree totally with Dan, but I kind of want to get some, you know, I'm curious about a couple of other things here. And one of them is, where do you see your artwork going? What do you want to do with your artwork? Like, do you see yourself making a book of this Alaska experience or do you see yourself having exhibitions? Or do you do it just for your own personal satisfaction? Do you have a goal in mind? I think I started with just personal satisfaction. Um, I would like to write a book and include these stories with the photographs. 
And I think just hearing Dan talk about that, it helps cement that idea that it would be much richer if I were to introduce some of those faces um, into the stories as well. Um, that's always been, I think writing and the photography and painting, it's, it's, it's a trifecta for me. I always tend to gravitate to one or the one, one of those three and writing is always a component of that. So I can definitely see some type of book work in the, in the future. And I can say I can absolutely relate to that, having the background in painting and doing the photography. I kind of juggle the multiple um, mediums myself. Mm -hmm. I also can relate to you know having that time to drive. And also, um, I happen to have a cousin that's a curator in Anchorage. So I'm cool. familiar with Anchorage and the Anchorage community. I haven't been there, but I am familiar with it through her. Um, I would not talk that much technically about your images because you obviously understand exposure. You obviously understand composition. I know with what you're showing here, I think your first two are very much, you know, similar in their vision. Your last two, not as much to me. I mean, we could all say, put it under the umbrella of landscape, mm -hmm. but I think something that you might want to think about doing is really narrowing it down. And a lot, what a lot of photographers do now is, you know, projects. Give yourself a project that you want to do, but make sure that project is not so broad that it's not attainable. And make sure the project is something you're passionate about, which we already know what you're passionate about because you could tell it in your voice when you were talking about it. And you weren't really talking about the landscapes so much as you were talking about the experiences with the people that you come in contact with. Um, I'm an introvert, believe it or not. I know Dan's gonna start laughing here, but, and I have a very hard time approaching people to photograph them, especially if I think I have to get a model release from them, you know, if I'm thinking, and I'm also very structured in my mindset in that, okay, what legal paperwork do I need? What do I have to do for down the road? Um, you know, so if you're gonna shoot people, you need to kind of think about that. Uh, but if you can, and you already are, it sounds like you're interacting with people. So you're comfortable doing that, which is something I'm not comfortable doing. Um, to be able to photograph them, to sit there and make them comfortable to where, you know, they aren't put off by you having the camera photographing them. Um, I think it would be an excellent project. And when you set out to do these projects, you want to do something that's attainable. So I don't know if you go back to Alaska regularly. I don't know if I missed that in your intro when you were talking about it. It's kind of like, don't set a project to shoot, you know, landscapes of Cuba if you can only get to Cuba once every five years. You've got to set something that's attainable, but also that you're passionate about and just shoot lots. You know, it, I, the more you shoot, the better. Um, but I think it would be a real benefit to sit down and kind of write goals of the project too. say, I want to do this and this is what I want to say with this project. And this is where I want to go with this project and put it in writing because that commits you to doing something. It's kind of like having a vision board. Um, and I do this myself all the time before I start something. I'm like, okay, this is how I see this going. This is how I see it working. You know, how does it fit into your lifestyle? You still work full time? Yes. Yeah. And I've been in that situation also. So you've got to think of what is attainable balancing that work life also with your artwork. Um, but my favorite image is the one that Dan held up, which was the golden light on the trees. And I actually could see a whole series of just these tree forms shot in Alaska, if you want to take it down narrower. Um, but there's an abstraction to that golden light that's washing down those trees that I just really, really like, um, which I think could be a project in itself. It is golden light, isn't it? <laughs> yes, um, yeah. Was that in Alaska, that particular that one? Was, that was in Gustavus. It's an island off of Juneau, southeast Alaska. What drew you to shoot the last image? The one of the, I think it's a Jeep, isn't it? Um, I love the hard nature of it. It was just drawing me to it because there was so much rust in that whole square of the picture. Um, I couldn't capture it all. There was so much rust and it just drew me in. I think um, it had been a, a while. It had been sitting in the yard of a friend of mine. He owned a whale watching business 
And so there was always boats around. So it was the only, only truck in the middle of this boat yard. And it had such presence with that color um, that I just, I had, I was drawn to it. I had to capture it. And you did it really well. Um, and that's what I was gonna say, but it does have a hardness that some of your other images don't have. Your tree images have this delicacy to them that, you know, place different than this. True. So if you were taking these images to show like a book publisher or to show a gallery or something, you would have to be very careful about your editing, okay. you know, to make sure that you have a consistent message and a consistent theme in what you're showing. Um, and this one to me just kind of, it's not a bad image. It's just in this project or this group of images, it's not quite as strong as some of your other ones for what it is. Um, I'm trying to see what else I have here. I made a few notes because I was looking at your work earlier today. Uh, I, you know, Dan talked about doing photography in this time of COVID and the odd thing about it, I, for me personally, I've had the best year I've ever had in photography as far as sales and opportunities. Wow. Um, and I don't know if it's because I am at home and I don't have the distractions of everything going on that I've been able to focus down on what I need to do. And I've just, you know, I, I make lists and I just check them off. At the beginning of every year, I make a goal list, you know, like I would like to be in this magazine or I would like to approach this person for an exhibition or whatever. And I see how many goals I can check up within the year. I'm in the middle of writing my goal list for 2021 right now. But I find that, you know, I have to structure myself to do stuff like that. Um, and part of what I've been partaking or participating in have been online portfolio reviews, which are very popular. I don't know if you're familiar with them with photography or not. No. Um, and you can sign up for, there's tons of portfolio reviews. There's like Filter Photo Festival in Chicago. There's Medium Festival. There's Photo Nola, Review Santa Fe. They cost money, but what it does is it affords you the opportunity to get your work in front of a variety of people in the arts whether it be museum curators, book publishers, magazine editors. But before you do that, you gotta make sure you have a consistent body of work. You have a really succinct artist statement that reflects what that body of work says. And then you can you know, put your work out there and get opinions from these people. The nice thing about it is it can afford you a lot of opportunities and a lot of exposure to a, a, a broader group. Um, and that's the nice thing about having Zoom and having the internet now is that we aren't limited to being in Florida or limited to the areas we're in. We can really reach out now and you know, get input from other areas. Uh, the place I would go to look around at is to go to Linscratch, L-E-N-S-C-R-A-T-C-H.com. And they list portfolio reviews, they list opportunities for exhibitions, they list magazines that are looking for images. And they also have a lot of great articles. I think it's really important if you're a photographer to look at tons and tons of images. Um, always look at images, other people's images, even stuff that you're not really think that you're interested in. You know, you wanna keep up and current on what's happening and what other people are doing. You're not looking to copy other people, you're looking just to be knowledgeable about what's going on in the field. Um, and Lynn Scratch is one of those great places that starts that. Um, I do know, I think, I don't know if she's still on here or not, but um, there's a photographer, Emma Powell, who is a very good photographer in storytelling and one of my favorite photographers, I saw her name go by here. Um, check out her stuff because Emma has a very distinct, you know, vision. She has a very planned, at least it gives me the appearance that she does. <laughs> she may at the end of this say she doesn't. But um, check out all sorts of different imagery. I don't know if this is helpful or not, or if this is the kind of- Very, image. very helpful. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Listen, I, I see, I Becky, are you done, Becky? Yeah, I can be done. Oh, no, I didn't mean to cut you off. I feel bad. No, no I, I just saw, I saw these questions coming up and I, and I saw a great one from Matthew and everything. I wanted to say one thing though, that you, when you were talking, it kind of, um, me as like someone who, Every once in a while, I'll go on Instagram. I, I get off it. I'll go back to it because I, I can't be on it all the time. Um, but the one thing that's amazing to me is um, that people see, people think if I get the perfect image, um, 
they're after like this perfection in, in a photographic image. Well, a lot of times you that image becomes inaccessible for, for someone. And therefore they'll just kind of scroll over it because it's almost like these photos you see of these models, whatever, that are just so flawless that they, they don't seem real. You know, it's like, and some of these drone photography and landscape artists, some of them are like too perfect. They, I almost want to like, so what I'm trying to say is don't shy away from, because obviously you know composition and stuff, but don't shy away when you start looking at these images with people of letting people into like an imperfect side of a, a situation. You know, a lot of people are running away from that now. And, and I think it's a complete disservice to the viewer because sometimes that, that crack is what gives the viewer access into that imagery, you know? Um, it's, you know it's Dan, not, I'm sorry, go ahead, Becky. I was gonna say, I think that kind of goes back to, you have to know the rules to break the rules kind of thing. Right, right. And, you know, back in the old days when I was in photography school, they told us never to put someone center of the composition, wow. you know, always offset right. them here, put them in the top third, below a third, whatever. And now I can't tell you the number of people that shoot figures and people dead center of the space. Right, right, you know, right. so, but part of that is, I would say, don't be afraid to experiment. And the nice thing about digital is you can shoot it. And if you don't like it, you can get rid of it. No one ever has to see it. But at least you've tried it to know, you know, if that's something you want to take further, or you know, if that's something that's just not going to go. It's funny. I watched um, my my son wanted. He likes films, and we he wanted to watch Kubrick's 2001. He never saw it. He heard about it. He never saw it. So over the Thanksgiving break, I watched it with, and I couldn't believe like everything he does is dead center. Like every image is completely symmetrical and completely. And it's so maddening. It's like, it just drives you almost crazy, but it works with his whole, like, you know, his whole outlook on film and creating this really kind of paranoid state. Like every single image was completely almost symmetrical and completely, you know, all the, all the diagonals and horizon lines led to the, to the center of the image, you know, and but, it but was again, cool. you know, for him to do that, he had to know the right way before he Right, that's what I'm saying. It was purposeful, right? But what I mean is it, it was is just so maddening. Like, and, and especially when you're shooting people in a community like you want to in Alaska, you want, you want that outsider to have access to that community through your photograph. Right. Does that make sense? Like Absolutely. that's the thing that, that's the thing that I would, and I think you're writing about it and these imagery, working hand in hand could really bear fruit for you. You know, I really do, you know? But listen, let's get to a couple of questions. I saw a couple of people made comments or Matthew had a great question or comment and then there was a couple others. So maybe we can go to that, Danielle? Yeah, sure. I'll yeah. read um, Matthew's and then if he wants to chime in and more people can talk about it. Great. Um, so he said to Dan's point, rather than thinking of the images as landscapes or portraiture, could there be a way to include people within the places? Um, Right. And then contrast Matthew also said to Rebecca's points, and Matthew, like I said, feel free to chime in here. <laughs> um, who do you see as the audience for your work and what do you hope to view them um, to take away from viewing it? Right. Which are really good points. Those are- right, um, It goes back to what Becky said, right? Um, go ahead, Matthew, I'm sorry. No, I just said, I mean, those are kind of rhetorical questions. I'm, I'm not like expecting an answer from those, but I think they're, they're things to, to think about as you move your work forward. It's very helpful. Um, I have realized that I have a, a new love for Florida after moving away and then moving back. And so a lot of my more recent work has been when we're hiking in Florida. And oh, so right. I feel like it's going to be uh, almost a concurrent theme that I'm working on this body of work that I so love in the communities that I met in Alaska while also wanting to capture what we're doing now. And I, I realized that I'm only gonna be able to do that when I retire in 10 years. <laughs> I don't think that's gonna happen while I'm working full time, but if I can move in steps toward that, um, I can't tell you how invaluable this is to get this feedback now so that I can have that focus and that goal in mind. Absolutely. Hey, I know a lot of artists that, you know, they didn't 
they didn't become recognized until their 50s and, you know, late 50s. And some of them just plotted away and this and that. And all of a sudden, you know, wow. Uh, there was one artist, I, I set up a show of hers a couple of years ago and she became famous when she was in her 90s. Like a, she was an abstract painter. And I was like, wow, it just was pretty amazing, you know, so. Nice. Um, yeah, I think Matthew's a great point. You just have to kind of, and I think Becky said something that I, I learned early on and it's been invaluable is write about, like write all your thoughts down, your what your, your intent is. And even if 80% of it is garbage and you go back and look at it later, the, the pieces that aren't garbage will stand out to you and, be, and they could really be incredibly, um, you know, directional in, in causing you to, to refocus and, and, and say, oh man, this is, this is what I want to, this is what I want to get to. Like just about hearing you speak was so great because all of a sudden this life came out and, you know, this connection. And I was like, oh my God, there it is. You know, that's, that's awesome. You know? So. Yeah. I was really <laughs> anticipating you talking a lot about the landscape and traveling and this and that. And then you just totally blindsided me by talking to people in Alaska. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> Did I miss a page of the statement or something? <laughs> yeah, right, right. But that's good. Who and, knew? You know, and there's a comment on there and there by this guy, Matt Larson, who I don't know. Um, <laughs> but he makes a very good point. You can have multiple projects going at once. Right. I mean, you can still be shooting your landscapes. You could be shooting, you know, heavy rusted vehicles and then still be doing your people stuff. And that's kind of nice because it kind of switches those chemicals in your brain to refocus to different things, which when you go back to the project, you have a fresh view again, you know, it's like you don't get stagnant. Um, some people can do it, some people find it frustrating. Um, but I think I like having multiple projects going at once. I usually have three or four books that I'm reading at one time. So I think that would be a so good- you, You've kind of, yeah. <laughs> Perfect. All right, and then Annette has some comments. Um, she said that she likes the contrast of the hard photo on the truck. And then um, she asked, what kind of camera did you use and the skill involving using the camera? So these are taken with a standard Android phone. Um, I had a Canon for a long time. So I used that for the Alaska photo, but everything else was taken with an Android. Kind of interesting, right? So it's, it's interesting how, and I'll just, Becky's going to correct me on, this is where Becky and I'll be, Becky, <laughs> Becky and Matt will just spank me on this yeah, one. I already know what you're going to say, but go ahead and say. <laughs> no, but it, it is interesting how, like I know a, a street photographer who only takes photos on his iPhone and you would swear that he had some expensive rig, you know? And then, so I, you know, so it's, it is, it is interesting how that, you know, the, the, the whole, Technology, like overcoming itself every couple months, is is uh, revolutionizing the game. But Becky, Becky is the, the technical person, so I'll yield to her on whatever she says for that. But I shoot probably eighty percent of my stuff on my iPhone. Um, I'm making composite negatives, so I'm shooting different objects. Like I'll shoot a landscape, and I'll shoot you know a figure, or I'll shoot a, a vase or a piece of furniture, or whatever, and then I'll compose them in Photoshop. And I make digital negatives using my iPhone uh that i use in the dark room uh i'm also if nobody i don't know who here knows or doesn't know but i'm married to a photographer also and we go back and forth i mean we will actually set out on a hike and say okay i've got to shoot with my camera today you know to put the phone away and sh shoot with a camera you know because it was ingrained in us that you know that's how you get good photos as you shoot with these cameras but it isn't you know the skill and the creativity and the vision is in you. It's not in that piece of equipment. That's just the tool you're using to get it out of you. If you get it out of you with an Android, that's perfect. You know, and if it meets your goal and you know you don't have to make them any larger than a certain size down the way, you're fine. You know, if you find that you're going to want to be doing exhibition prints that are 40 by 50 inches, you might want to rethink the Android, you know, so that you have a better digital file to use but see i surprised you dan um i'm like my <laughs> mind is blown i'm like there i'm like Whoo. yeah it's you know it's it's a tool not unlike you know the paintbrush or whatever somebody else uses yeah. it's, it's just the tool anymore and there's so many people using phones you know to do bodies of work yeah yeah 
Okay. Well, listen, Kit, are you are you happy with the feedback you got? Very much so. I can't thank you enough. This is really helpful. No, listen, I, I'm I'm so. This is the thing I love about these intimate conversations. Is I remember a couple of years ago, this one, um, you, you know, young woman was she was really connected to her work and and she was she was showing me stuff. But then all of a sudden, she said something in her conversation to me. And I was like, did you realize what you just said? And she's like, no, I didn't say that. I was like, yeah, you just said that. And when she thought, she's like, oh my God, I did, didn't I? And she, it kind of caused this whole like reconnection with her work on another level, you know? And a lot of times when we're, the worst thing is that's why, believe it or not, that's why we have curators is because artists should almost never be able to set up their own work. I mean, and with few exceptions, you know, because a lot of times what they do in the studio is not the best way for that work to be presented to the to a larger audience, you know? Like, you know, when I was working in these big museums in New York in the 80s and 90s, some of these curators were absolute geniuses by seeing stuff and conversations going on in the artist's work that the artists weren't seeing. You know, the artists were, you know, presenting this raw material, but then the curator was actually causing that conversation to take place and, you know, arranging this conversation with other works and stuff. And so, um, yeah, so these, I think these conversations are really important. You know, they, they're, they're beneficial to all of us and kind of um, getting outside ourselves, especially ourselves in the studio where we're so isolated, you know. Absolutely. Uh, being on the curator end here, Dan, it, you know, I think a lot of times the artists just get way too close to their work. I yeah. mean, they have it in their mind what they want that work to say and what they think they've accomplished with that work, but then put it in front of someone else and it's just like, it's nowhere near what their vision was. And that's why sometimes it is, you know, the curator that brings those different elements together to make that yeah. message. But you can also do that on your own sometimes by just putting your work away for a period of time. Right, right. And then bring it out and look at it fresh. And I, I used to actually teach high school also. I'm 103 years old, in case you didn't know. Um, <laughs> but one of the things we used to tell students at school was to turn their work upside down, you know, because that automatically kind of flips what's going on there in your right brain, left brain to visualize it, you know, in a different way and then flip it back, you know, and see where you are with it and to look at it compositionally upside down. All right, and Daniel has his hand raised if he wants to um, chime in. Please, yeah. Is he mad? I, I, there was, but I didn't really raise my hand. I was actually writing a comment. Um, but it reminds me of what Becky just said. I, I always use the, um, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, yes. Okay, I, I use the Duchamp's coefficient of creativity and it's the unexpressed but intended over the unintentionally expressed. Um, the uh, expressed, you know, it's it's a negotiation between the viewer and the artist, if you will. An artist has intentions. You look at it and go, well, I don't see that. And you say, well, I see this. And they say, well, that's not what I meant. Somewhere in there is the truth. Somewhere in right, there is the creativity. Right. It's really an, act, an active thing. I think Becky's right about turning upside down, putting them away for a while and pulling them out later. Um, I'm not really one for encouraging artists to destroy work because often artists make bad choices. Um, and sometimes good workers are destroyed um, and or you might later find you want to use them for something else. Um, I mean, uh, I don't know, like uh, Lee Krasner saved paintings and years later, you know, tore up stuff and used them in collage works and made some of her great black paintings. Right, um, you right. just never know what you've got to find or use, especially if it's digital files, heck, keep them. Um, you know, and then also history and historians will, will uh, you know, go through those. I mean, we wouldn't, there's a lot of photographers that frankly, uh, were discovered because their negatives were discovered and they were already dead. And curators and artists in some cases were the ones that brought them to the fore. And they're now people that were stunned by what they achieved. Um, so, so be a little careful about that. Um, and I guess I would just say that the, the landscapes had great light. It seemed like light was what you were pursuing. Photography is about light. I actually like the truck image, Becky, but I think that belongs in a whole different body of work. Um, yeah. It was in the same body of work. It was like a, an add-in saying, well, and like, what do you think of this? And, you know, go off and pursue that. That could be real interesting too. Yeah, and I wasn't sure if you had picked your four images because you just wanted to see a variety of responses or if you picked your four images as a body of work when you selected them for the critique, so. Yeah, not necessarily as a body of work, just 
to just, represent that I'm all over the place right now. <laughs> and it, there's nothing wrong with that right now, you know? Yeah. Well, Kit, thank you so much. Thank you, really. Well, thank you all. So listen, thank you everybody. Please chime in um, in our second half here with our second artist. And um, so I'm gonna introduce uh, Stephanie Ong right now, or Ong, I think Ong, right? Song Ong, right? Yeah. Yes. Um, right, and um, Stephanie is in her studio with that perfect studio backdrop to her Zoom. So uh, Stephanie, go ahead, just tell us a little something about yourself and and, I know we had a great conversation on the phone yesterday. So you were, um, you said some interesting stuff and I'll let you share that with the rest of uh, our group here tonight. Sure, I hope I can remember it. Um, hi, I'm Stephanie. Um, I live in Tampa. I am a painter um, and I do abstract paintings these days. Um, can you all hear me okay? I've got a 15 year old, two dogs, it's almost 13 year old and a bird. So I apologize for any background noise. No, you sound good. Okay, and one plays guitar. So <laughs> that might happen too. Um, but um, I am originally from Parkland, Florida. Um, and uh, I moved to Tampa. Oh, it's been like 20 something years now. Um, I, my background with as far as education goes, um, I was always planning on going to art school and for a multitude of reasons, I ended up uh, going to University of Florida, fine art uh, switched quickly. Um, my backup plan, I always wanted to do fine art and be a painter and I kind of panicked. It was the mid nineties and art was being defunded and um, I, I, got, uh, I got scared. And so I switched over to, um, to speech therapy and I did pediatric speech therapy uh, for 15 years. I got my master's in it and I worked predominantly with kids with autism. Um, and I kind of used art, I didn't kind of, I, I used art as a means of communication, kind of as a bridge to be able to um, increase verbal communication and also uh, help with, with cognitive development um, or rather being able to represent what they knew. Um, and so for, for me, um, it was kind of the, the flip side of being an artist. Um, I wasn't really producing a lot of art, but I was feeling like it was, um, it was kind of a, a vehicle for me in my job. Um, that being said, my biggest regret was that I didn't push through the fears and do art as my main gig. Um, so about eight or nine years ago, I decided I was gonna give it a go. Um, again, I'm a mom and I realized that I was teaching my kids to take the easy route. And, uh, and that was kind of scary too. So um, when I went back to painting, I wasn't in the position to be able to go back to art school, which is what I kept saying to myself every year. I'll go back to art school. After I do this, I'll go back to art school, I'll go back to art school. And I never got back to art school. I even said it last year. Um, so here I am no art school still, a little bit of training at Ringling. And um, I just started painting again. And uh, uh, you know, what? the last time I had seriously painted to this extent, I was in my early twenties and uh, I was very egocentric in my painting. I wasn't an abstract painter at the time, really. I, I've always had a, a big appreciation for abstract art, but it really wasn't my thing. Um, I actually was more into portrait art, um, but something happened, I guess, along the way. And I, I really do think it had something to do with, with being a speech therapist and working so much on this communicative intent um, and this kind of scaffolding of, of, of the mind. Um, and everything I kind of did, you know, I kind of like put myself through early art school things. I would do trainings for myself. I would force myself to do like gesture drawings or, or, or et cetera. And, um, I just kept coming back to this, to this abstract art. And for me, I guess it would be like abstract expressionism because it is really focusing on that communicative intent. It's, um, it's conversations. It's um, it, it, like noxema. Um, like when you have, when you smell noxema, like it, it brings you back to when you're young and you had a sunburn and you could feel the sand and you, you know, the prickly heat of the sunburn. And uh, you remember your little brother, you know, deliberately poking you and just to make it hurt and that kind of thing. That's the stuff I end up painting. Um, so 
I, uh, I think most of my work kind of ends up falling into series. Um, I think what ends up happening is a series develops along the way and then I kind of refine it. Uh, so this piece that's on the screen right now, Pedal Back, was part of my last body of work. And uh, that was called, I, I titled it Circa because I had a, uh, a show, a, a solo exhibition that opened on March, I think it was 8th, no, March 6th. Sorry, there's a paper in front of me. It opened on March 6th. And um, in Tampa, we closed, what, like March 12th, 13th? We shut down, so um, it was very short-lived, uh, but it was on life cycles. And, um, and most of my work kind of falls into these different categories, um, but they all kind of circulate around several different things, communication, um, history of a big, it, I'm very interested in the different layers. And I think maybe some of that has to do with, I grew up in a town that I was one of the first people to graduate high school from. So it was a new town and no one knew, I mean, obviously everybody knows it now, but nobody knew of it um, up until a couple of years ago, unfortunately, but uh, it was just this little blip um, and it had no history. And so when I moved to Tampa, I was in this town where there's a lot of history here. It just wasn't my history. And it was really interesting to be an observer to that and to kind of see you know, like just today I was driving my daughter somewhere and underneath the asphalt was, there was a pothole and we hit it and there was a puddle in the pothole and inside it, you could see the bricks coming out. And that stuff really kind of gets to me a lot in a good way. Um, it's kind of those layers, you know, of history and the layers of communication. Um, and prior, so when I, I was said, when I was, you know, a younger painter or a younger artist, I guess then I probably did a lot more uh, mediums, but uh, I was very interested in what I had to say. And then when I got, I, when I went back into painting, I was in my early mid thirties as a mom and I had this career in speech therapy and um, it got to be a lot more about, you know, it was closing that circle of communication. It was not just what I had to say, but it was also how it was interpreted um, and what it meant to be interpreted um, that kind of drove the work. Danielle, can you go on to another one of her images, please? Or the next okay. one? So, um, okay. okay, so that one is also, I think I may have sent you the, all of them from this last body of work. So that's Circa. That actually, so I was saying that a lot of times there'll be a kind of a development in my work. I'll, I get this weird feeling where I know I'm done with something, but I can't figure out where I'm going next. So I'll just try to, to work through it. I, I do a lot of research, I'm, I'm a nerd, and I do a lot of research. Um, in this case, I was doing research on scarabs. Um, it, it started with a bug. I, actually, several series of mine have started with bugs randomly. And uh, I, I started researching scarabs and then I started researching um, the Egyptian uh, life cycles, et cetera. And, um, uh, there was a painting previous to this that I didn't share, but that one kind of got it started. And this one, I felt like I really kind of honed in on that, that feeling. And for me, this one is actually about death um, and, um, and life at the same time. Um, and I think an easy interpretation would be there's light versus dark, but I really didn't intend that. Um, and I actually didn't notice it until I'm looking at it as a little picture on my computer screen, because it's Danielle, kind can of- you put up this one? Oh, solstice. So that one's actual full death. And uh, for me, this was kind of, I named it solstice because of it being that, that full and complete event. Um, I, my, I was very close with my grandparents. Um, they kind of were my, my parental figures in many ways. And my grandfather's who taught me to paint. And so as he aged and, uh, you know, and he's since passed, but um, there's something about uh, the finality of life that gets kind of missed along the way. Sometimes we're so worried about it ending, but you don't see the fullness of it. And to me, this was the fullness of it. Can um, I, can I, be, can I, 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 I want to go back to you, sure. but I want to, can I just diverge and let's just, get into some meat now, which is going to be really fun. Okay, go. Because I don't want to get too far along. I don't want to interrupt you. I know I'm not trying to be rude, but <clears throat> so like to me, right? 
a couple of things you said, but I know people choose careers, right? And you said you chose a career, but a speech therapist for children with autism is not an easy career. No. Does that make no, and it and it deals with a lot of times nonverbal communication as well, right? It's like so here you have abstract painting, which is kind of like, you know, I mean, ever since the, the glory days of post-war abstraction, you know, with Joan Mitchell and Helen Frankenthaler and, you know, um, you know, you've had abstraction really, I mean, those women really were groundbreaking, kicking ass, but it was all about this reinterpretation of communication, reinterpretation of, um, you know, it was women asserting themselves in, in the art field, you know, in the art world. And they weren't, they weren't playing around. Those are some, some of Jones Mitchell work from that period is really my, some of my favorite painting from that period. But, um, but like what I'm trying to say about the autism thing, that's like a, that's like a heavy, heavy thing that it's not just the job you go to. I mean, I couldn't do that for a job. You know what I mean? It would wear on me. You know what I mean? So, so I think like, the two things that were, you know, that you saying that your grandfather taught you to paint, which is kind of an interesting thing. And then you hearkening back to like, but how do you relate your, your work to now that you see it back through your career, this whole, whole notion of trying to communicate, you know, life, big issues, right? Because autism deals with big issues, you know, like life, death, the ability to communicate nonverbally, um, you know, how do you relate that now to, do you see it? Maybe this, this going this way with the autism thing was a, something that needed to happen. You know what I mean? I'm, I don't think you like, what I'm trying to say is you said, well, I took the easy road, but that to me, you took a career road, you chose a career road, but you didn't choose necessarily an easy career road. You know what I'm saying? So. Right. I took the most difficult piece of speech therapy there possibly was, and I jumped right in. So right. that's definitely true. Um, I'm not really known for doing things the easy or well, right, that kind of right. Okay. Ways. Um, but, oh, sorry. Um, but to, to your point, I do think that that's interesting. And, you know, when I, when I first started painting, I hid that I wasn't a painter for a while. Kind of like, didn't want anybody to know. Cause I thought it took away some legitimacy. Cause I had talked myself into this idea that no, you know, you didn't, you didn't go to art school. You didn't, you don't deserve to be doing this. And, um, and it's so interesting because as I started painting and, and people, I kind of kept that secret too, to be honest. And people in, you know, in my community who might come through my house for one reason or another, they said, you know, we always knew you were an artist. Why did you think that, that you were, you know, why did you think you were hiding it? And I mean, it, it really took me years to be able to call myself an artist because I felt like I lost that. Um, oh, now I'm getting deep, but I felt like I lost that right. So it's interesting because I do think, um, like to your point, autism, it's, it, it's super fascinating, but it's in so many ways, it's an overdevelopment of the mind as opposed to an underdevelopment of the ability to communicate. Um, and, and I think that I can relate a lot to that because I think my visual system is probably slightly over, overrun because <laughs> this is just kind of what it looks like in my head on a daily basis. So, you know, it's funny. My, my father was a, a, a gym teacher. My mom was a gym teacher and then she retired to raise a family. My father was a gym teacher, a, a basketball coach. A, and um, I played sports in high school. I was always split between the art artists in high school and the jocks. And I just liked playing sports. So I did it, but I never fit in with the jocks, you know? And I always had this massive identity crisis going on about calling myself an artist. Does that make sense? And even, even, and even somebody forced me to go to school of visual arts in Manhattan um, when I went, you know, and, and I, even when I was there, it took me years and I, and I was, I took like a completely different route, I thought to get, because I, I was like, I had this notion in my head of what an artist was, you know, and, but it was, it was a mistaken notion, but it was like, it was a notion that I had put there because I was raised in this blue collar environment, you know what I mean? And, and I didn't feel like I had the right to because I, maybe I didn't understand. So I beat myself up for years and I, 
pushed myself and pounded myself of saying like, oh man, you know, you don't deserve this thing. And so I worked harder than everybody else. And, and, um, and maybe it did some service to me now, but it really didn't allow me to just breathe and exist within my work. Is that like, now I'm doing it because I'm, you know, in the last 10 years and 15 years of my life, I'm comfortable with it. I know who I am and, you know, but it took me a long time to get there. I was always living in these two camps at the same time simultaneously, you know, and I never feel like I belonged in either, you know? Totally. And um, I did, you know, I did construction jobs to, you know, to put myself through grad school. I delivered, you know, used car parts for a junkyard in Brooklyn. I mean, it was like very schizophrenic, you know? Mm -hmm. But, um, but what hey, I'm trying I to say is- dead people. What's that? I shot dead people. Right, and <laughs> Becky Becky shot Ted Bundy. Isn't you got to tell that story before they? No, but make the story short. I'm, what I'm trying to say is, um, this image and the other. This isn't really one of my favorite ones of yours. I, I like the line work, but the ones that I like are. Uh, can you go to another one, Danielle? I'm sorry. Like I'll stop you on it. Yeah, like this one and this one, especially, they do harken back to me to that kind of like that golden age of like, cause I, I met some of these artists, these women artists that when I was working in New York, you know, I, I was in Helen Frankenthaler's studio. I set up shows for her. Man, these women were badasses. They were like no nonsense. They had, you know, kind of carved out a territory for themselves. They were really smart, but they were very committed and very kind of like, um, I don't know, they, they just knew where they were in the, in the moment they were in, which was really kind of rare, you know? Um, but I'm just trying to figure out, like, there's a lot of things going on, you know, gestural abstraction has a lot to do with drawing and mark making and, you know, as opposed to passages of painting, like a regular painting. And, you know, like you can look at these where the, there's a lot of openness in your drawing, like, you know, like the openness of a page in a, you know, in a drawing as, as opposed to a painting. But there's a lot of great stuff going, going on in there. And I have a couple of references that I thought of, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to let Becky, wait, just wait, Daniel. I'm going to let Becky go quick and then I'll dovetail on and then we'll take some questions. But um, I do want to just hammer it out with you once Becky's done of this whole notion of your identity as an artist, right? I think that's important, right? And I'm probably going to lead into that. Um, I love your work. I, I really like the work on paper. And this is one of my favorite ones is this first one, as opposed to the ones on canvas. And what draws me into this image is, you know, your fields of color, but those delicate lines that you've layered on top really to me speaks to your message of communication. Um, I, I think it's a very successful piece. I'm not that strong about the gold leaf. I think you have to be very careful when you use gold leaf. Um, and I'm not sure that you really had to, you know, that it couldn't be done a different way. Um, but what I find interesting to kind of divert from all of it is that both of you have done these bodies of work, but when you're called to speak about your work, you're speaking 180 degrees opposite of what you're showing. Right, and, right. And this is, I'm going to be play the bad guy here since Dan made me wear black. Um, it makes me wonder, like, did you have in your mind a preconceived idea of what an artist statement should be about your work? And you wrote what you thought people needed to hear about your work? Because I think if you were to step back and be very sincere with yourself and write about what you just said about, you know, working with autism students and working about the communication and everything, it's a stronger statement about your work than what you currently have. I mean, your statement now is nice, but it's really not getting into the nitty gritty of what your work is really about. And maybe you were afraid to say that. And I can totally relate to that because for years I would write about in circles about what I thought my work was about. And I wasn't being very honest with myself about what it was about. Um, I've been real fortunate in that I was part of this creative capital program out of New York. And they do these intense workshops, these three day workshops. And one of the things is writing about your work and getting your elevator speech down. You know, if you were in the elevator and you had only four minutes, you know, someone said, hi, I'm so-and-so, what is your work about? Can you really fluidly say, my work speaks to blah, 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 blah. 
you know, one of the exercises they give you is to like pick eight words that describe your work. Now write three sentences using those eight words and that is your succinct elevator speech or your statement. Um, and you have done that just in your conversation with Dan talking about your background and what you do, you know, and the career you chose. The same with um, Kit. I mean, Kit did it when she was talking about, you know, talking to people and interviewing people in Alaska. You know, that's a much stronger statement than the one she has currently about her landscapes. You know, and that's, to me, you all are so close to the edge of having it all together there. Um, but that's, you know, kind of a digression here from the work. Uh, the other thing is, and I went snooping around for both of you to see what I could find. And I think it's really important, and I think you're very successful at it, Stephanie, in that you have your website, you have your Instagram, you have everything that has a very consistent look and feel to it. And I think that's really important as you're starting to get your work out there and you're approaching people for exhibitions, you know, that it's, it's there, everything's labeled well, you know, if I as a curator was looking for certain types of paintings like you did, I could go to your site, I know the sizes of them, I know, you know, it's easy to navigate. Um, I think that was really important to me on the business end of it. Um, but like I say, I prefer the works that you've done on paper, like this particular piece, to the larger ones. Um, I don't know. I think you seem a lot looser and more free when you're doing this type of work, as opposed to once you switch over to the canvas. And a you're little less convoluted. Yeah. I think you may be like, oh, you know, it's like, it's a canvas and I have to do this and I have to do that. And I have to, you, you're maybe you're like, you're more tentative working. So I kind of use one as a, as a means to the other, like one informs the other in mm -hmm. a way. So I kind of go back and forth between canvas and paper. paper. And I think by the virtue of paper being paper, you can't go too far, right? Otherwise paper falls apart. And so I think that is, what um, the limits of paper, I think, end up really helping the paintings at the end of it all. Um, like th this piece, actually, Storyteller, some of them take a long time and some of them don't. Um, I probably spend a lot more time looking at them and thinking about them and obsessing about them and dreaming about them um, mm. than, than putting brush to paper or to canvas in that in this sense. But this one kind of almost developed in the same way as a work on paper. Um, they, they all kind of come in layers is kind of how I paint, but there definitely is more, you know, when I painted this, I painted it in a similar fashion to the works on paper, I would guess, I think. It feels like a work on paper to me, let's put it that way, <laughs> even though it's on paper. <laughs> on paper it's like you know that you can't mess around and play with it long so you just like kind of go with it and you're more flowing in what you're doing to me mm -hmm. and I think once you go to the canvas you're like well I can rework this or I can rework that or I can do this right. and you <laughs> overthink it maybe mm -hmm. um it's not that you know they're they're definitely nice images but like I say I just prefer your ones on paper Dan's going to disagree with me um no no but no. you know to kind of hone in on what Dan was going to address too is it's just to me it's very fascinating that you both talked about something different totally from what you you know initially put out there as you know what your work was about listen you know one thing I, i'm sorry becky you were done i'm done one thing i wanted to say was you know it was nice for me to listen to becky and i could just shut up and, and think for a second was um you know one thing being a parent like you're a parent you know i i have three kids i um, I'm a single parent now. Um, I always thought I had to have this life, it goes back to that blue collar thing, that, you know, this way I was raised or my, you know, the, the life that my grandparents gave me or should have gave me or whatever, you know. And meanwhile, the, the part of me that my kids love is the part of me that's very honest in my engagement with my work, you know. And, and um, the whole reason I'm bringing that up is, um, like, I think, I think you're, I think, I think what I'm seeing, and, and you can get me wrong, like, I don't want to say anything, but like, what I mean is, I think you're kind of controlled and you're existing on this one level, but I do think there's this real tenacity and this commitment and this thing underlying the surface that you really haven't let out fully yet, because I see 
hints of it in your work. Like I, I really, one reason I wanted to bring up, you know, Joan Mitchell was she was kind of fearless in her, her application of pain. You know what I mean? Like in her, um, and I, I listed a couple of other artists that I'll get to in a minute that I thought you could look at as references. Um, and I was pretty right on with one of them, Becky. You'll see in a second how, how good I was at picking this one artist. No, so uh, yeah, this one is actually funny. This one, this one is a, um, a contemporary Asian abstraction, abstract painter. And her name is Christine I T J O E to Joe or Joe or, and, um, but in here there's abstractions of uh, bugs, like bug wings. And so it's pretty funny that I kind of looked at your work and I was like, oh, I remember this artist when I worked at Christie's and I went and looked her up for you. And, and she abstracts like insect parts, right? But I mean, she doesn't really hold back from it. You can kind of see them all, like these dissected bugs in there and stuff. It gets a little gritty, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and the next one was uh, Catherine Cellerini Moore. She's actually a friend of mine. I've in included her, I curated her into a couple of shows. She did this series called Lifelines and her mom was an alcoholic and um, her mom was passing away from alcohol. She was dying from alcoholism and Catherine didn't, know how to like she did this work called lifelines and then this body of work called um the more i try to save her and they're just these incredible small paintings and works on paper she did hundreds of them one right after another and um they were just tr they were her trying to deal with what she was experiencing um and try to turn around that kind of experience with her mom into something positive you know um, and then there was one other one, just so you should know this, this artist I felt, um, the last one. And uh, this is an Asian abstract painter, really well known, uh, Zhao Wu Qi. He passed away, he was a Chinese painter that spent, spent most of his time in, um, in Paris. But um, he was pretty, he was very well known. And, but the reason I, I wanted to pass him along is his work, um, sells for a lot of money. Like I think one of his works at Christie sold for about 13 million. So um, sometimes when you can see similarities, because there are similarities that I see between their work and your work, you know, it's an encouragement, but it's an encouragement. The reason I thought of them, and I'm so happy that I was right on in the bug one, that's pretty funny, was um, the fact that you can be, I, what I want to see is just like, cause I really like your mark making. Your mark making to me, as someone who holds drawing in like the highest, you know, for me, drawing is everything, um, that your mark making seems very, very honest. And that's, that's kind of very rare. Like, you know, a lot of times it gets pretty or it tries to be pretty with people that are doing abstract work, especially contemporary abstract painters. And um, they, they shy away from the fact that those marks are actually trying to convey that unspoken thing, right? Do you know what I mean? Yes, so here, yes. here it goes back, like you said something in your artist statement about focusing on what gets lost, reinterpreted and adapted in a conversation. I thought that was the one really honest line in your, in your artist statement. And that would, to me, that dovetails exactly what Becky and I are talking about, about the, the autism thing. You know, like that line to me directly relates to, I mean, I can't, I don't, I, I'm speaking from someone who doesn't know what he's talking about as far as relating to autistic people, you know, or children, but that seems to me like that line could be interpreted in a artist statement. Oh, and that was, that last one was a, a detail of a Joan Mitchell work. And I was laughing at some of the, you could see some of the mark making is pretty similar, you know, mm -hmm. but, um, but what I want, what I, the thing to me about abstraction is um, at the heart of it, like there's a lot of really bad abstraction out there, like a lot of bad art, but at the heart of abstraction is this kind of fearlessness, you know, to kind of allow the mark to be what it is and allow that mark to convey something that's larger than itself. Like you talking about life and death and, you know, a lot of these people wanted to convey these big ideas, you know, they wanted to you know, free themselves from some literal, literal inter interpretation of their work, you know? Um, I, had, I had these massive drawings that I did in a show in New York, and um, this one person that showed up was like a theoretical 
physicist and oh my god he looked at one of my work and went off for 20 minutes talking to me and it was nothing that i in, intended in the work but it was the best one of the best like you know reviews of my work i've ever gotten you know because he he heartfelt <clears throat> went someplace and was inspired you know the beautiful thing about abstraction is it leaves that kind of open narrative like if you paint a picture about a flower or something, the narrative is pretty much closed, what it is. Abstraction leaves an open narrative that everybody can interpret in a different way, you know, kind of like classical music or something like that, but, um, or jazz or something. That's why a lot of these early, you know, uh, painters were inspired by jazz. Um, but all I'm trying to say is like, don't be afraid to let that, you know, if you're talking about death or if you're talking about anger, to let that out of the box a little bit, you know? Um, uh, even if even if it doesn't work, you know, the good thing is like, you know, just let it out and, and then see where that takes you. You know what I'm saying? That's so interesting because I literally was going through that this morning when I was painting. I don't know if you could see it behind me. There's two, but... Um, but I, I was doing my mark making and I was, I almost stopped myself. I actually did stop myself because I felt like I was getting too into the mark and I was, I, I was, I was losing sight of the bigger picture. Um, and it was, um, it felt very vulnerable. Not, and so I probably should have allowed the vulnerability, which, you know, I think maybe go circles back to the artist statement and having maybe one line that speaks more to vulnerability of the work um and instead i kind of wanted to cloak that with some schmutz it's so funny because that and look, thank you for using schmutz i'm from new york that's one of my Come favorite on. words ever <laughs> all my jewish all my jewish friends in new york would be loving that right now that's like my favorite you know you got schmear a bagel with a schmear and you got schmutz and no but li listen what you ex what you just said and i, I you know I, I i'm so happy because it's exactly what i was feeling in your work like like you're right on the threshold of allowing the marks to do some really incredible things, you know? Like they're they're right there and you have this, see sometimes the worst thing in the world to have is a beautiful hand. Like if you can make a beautiful mark, oh my God, sometimes that's the worst thing because you stay there, right? You just stay there and you, then you want like if the, if the, if the really raw mark comes out, you wanna kind of cloak it because you're like, wait, that's not beautiful anymore. But meanwhile, that's a really honest mark. You know what I mean? Like a lot of these early abstractionists had to deal with this, you know, um, you know, what, what's an honest, like honest mark making? They didn't want to interpret their own marking. They just wanted to get outside the, the you know, that evaluation of themselves. And, but that, that's the only thing I, I really, that to me though is revolutionary. Like in, in an artist's life, if you get to that point, and the fact that you had that experience in your studio um, today is to me, it's like, cause that's what I feel like. I feel like your work is very manicured in a way. It's very, it, it's very pleasing in its appearance, but man, there had to be some frustrating shit that happened in years of teaching autistic kids. And there has to be some understanding of nonverbal verbal communication that you have that's so much better than what I understand. You know what I mean? Like, and a lot of times that mark, you have to allow that mark to be itself, you know? Right, okay. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's funny, Eastern, Eastern societies go after that. You know what I mean? Like I know people that do Chinese brush painting and they're after, they, they spend their whole life trying to get there where the honest, the mark becomes incredibly honest. And, and the mark itself embodies, you know, that kind of tension and fear or life and death. The mark itself embodies that, that notion, right? So, and, and abstraction, abstract painting is a very, very Eastern way in a lot of ways, you know, very Eastern philosophy in a lot of ways, so. But listen, does that make sense, Becky, what I said? Yeah, totally. Um, like I said, I, I think the mark making is, you know, such a strong element of her work. And I sit here and I'm thinking, okay, let's remove that mark making to where we just have the color fields on there. Is it as strong, you know, can they both stand alone or not? The mark making could almost stand alone, you know, because it is that strong and that, you know, successful. 
I think it's interesting in that, you know, you didn't want to confront that today. <laughs> And I think a, almost all of us go through that. I know I went through a period of time where I would set up these abstract photographs and hand paint them. And I did outdoor art shows and people would say, well, what do you mean by that? Why'd you do this? Why'd you do that? And I'm like, I'm not gonna explain myself. I don't have to, you know, I want people to bring to it what they wanna bring to it. And, you know, I now can see that's a real cop out. You know, you, you've got to lead people in some direction at some point with a little bit of something. Um, at least that's my thought <laughs> now. Yeah. I've kind of had a change of a heart here. Um, and I, I, I think you're just so close uh, with them and it's, I, they're beautiful. I, I really like them. Yeah. I but it goes, it goes back to that. It goes back to that thing of, um, you know, I was laughing with some friends because one of them texted me this photo, you know, here we go on Instagram, right? And it was this model that would paint in her New York studio and she would paint in like lingerie in front of her canvas. And I thought it was a joke when I first got the photo, you know, because, because it was like so ridiculous. It was stupid, you know? But everybody in the work, everybody in their, her comments were like, oh, your work is so lovely. And it was garbage. It was horrible, dreadful stuff. But I'm thinking, man, this is this is the world that we're challenged because she had all these followers. Oh my God, hundreds of thousands of followers, you know. But all these, every photo was a cheesy photo of, and I thought it was like a, like a kitsch kind of like like comedy thing, but it wasn't. It was for real, you know. So what I'm trying to say is, we like Instagram and social media love that perfect. Oh, this looks like a painting. Yeah. And this what it is oh, and I can relate to it, yeah. And it's like, oh, I like that because it looks like a painting. Well, that's not really what people need, you know? They really need something that is like really a painting, not looks like a painting. You know, there's a difference between looking like art and being art, you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. yeah, it's like, you know, and like Matthew, Matthew Mosher has a great piece in our gallery. It's just so stripped down. It's, it's, a, it's a gun, uh, like it looks like an M16. And um, it's, it's just on like a big photo tripod, but it has this technology in it that it follows you around the room when you're in there. And it's just this, it's so unnerving, but I love it because it's so, it, it, you, it's so stripped down. Like he doesn't try to make it look like this beautiful art installation or something. He just is leaving this raw little piece of equipment in the, in the end of the gallery. But the whole thing it does when it follows you around the room is it completely unnerves you. It's like very, very, very scary, you know, that you have this gun automatically following you around the room, you know. It's funny, Dan, because you were saying that someone misinterpreted your large um, pencil drawings. Yeah, like yeah. The ones with the drapes or what? Yeah, yeah. Probably about 10 years ago, I did these large pinhole photographs that were like banners. And they were hanging in this gallery on the wall. And I just happened to be at the gallery and I was behind the wall when this guy came in with a tour group. And he started, you know, deconstructing my images and what they all meant. You know, and the first thing he said was that I was, you know, I'd had a bad time with the church. Maybe I'd been molested as a child, <laughs> you know, and I was against the Catholic religion. And I mean, he just read into everything from, you know, the kitchen sink to the garbage disposal into my images, none of which is what those images were about. <laughs> right, right. So it, it, this perception of, you know, what you put out there and what people grasp. Right. Um, the best thing, the best thing what Becky just said is, don't think you're gonna give the viewer what they need, because you don't know what they need. The best thing you can do is, be honest in what you're putting out there. And a lot of times that honesty comes from exactly like that conversation of those things you're wrestling with. Because the great thing about art is we have this thing called like our shared humanity, right? So if, if I'm going through these things, I'm dealing with life and death and all that crap that you're dealing with and everybody else is dealing with, it. we're just all dealing with it with our own way. But if I see it honestly in your work, then that's going to be the access point for me to get in there and stay a while. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Which makes I'm, it I'm, I'm really, I really, I really run away from art that looks like art nowadays. Like, yeah. it's like, it's almost like trying too hard for me, you know? And I, and I, and the parts of your work that I like, like, I really like this, 
your colors are great, but I really like this dark mark making on here, you know, on some of them, they're beautiful, you know? Which um, I think right now we're getting a whole lot of cheesy COVID pieces. I mean, yes, yes. you know, right. I'm trapped in my home and I'm doing this and, uh, you know, you've got to be very careful about how that's handled. Hey, the last thing I wanted to talk to you was you made, I made a note of, you talk about history, right? Like in the layering of history and stuff like that. Does that still ring true to you? Like when you say that, is that like, is it, is that just have to do with like the layering of an abstract work? Is that how you relate that to history or? Um, so more of like the history of a space. So what's here now, what was here before you, what will be left when you leave? Um, not necessarily in a conservation sense, but, um, right. but you know, conservation is good, but, um, but, but more kind of like kind of the planes of, of things, if that makes more sense. Uh, right. You know, what, what's kind of, what was here before you were here? Like, why do you think, you know, I think we are a very self-important right. generation, right? And I think that we, we think that we are just the greatest, you know, we're the greatest nation, we're the greatest this. And, um, and I think that that's ridiculous. And I, it, it it's constant it's a constant thought of mine so it ends up playing into um to the work and also you know back to like life cycles um not just in humans but also in you know just in in, in our surroundings in nature um ever since i was little i've been fascinated with patterns in nature um right. you know the similarities like um like, like a lightning strike is the same as like it looks like your veins which looks like the roots of a of a of a, a tree right. so right. i think history in that sense um right no that makes sense organic organic history or man-made history yes like, yes good <laughs> okay no but listen i would i would just like if you have some works that you don't feel have made it i would encourage you to go back in and and be a little destructive with them you know mm -hmm. what i mean and like my friend he's a great he's one of the best painters i've ever met he's up in canada and he refers to his paintings as his um dysfunctional children you know and he just wants to get them to the point when they can leave the house on their own <laughs> so but it's I a really honest way of looking at art you know like he doesn't want it he doesn't think of it like, and, and some days they'll be like, oh man. And he'll just, he'll get to a point when it's it's looking like art and he'll notice it and he'll just destroy it and go back in again. Like when it but, gets, they but, so what he, Sorry, but what he does get at the end though, the ones he does get at the end, they're gorgeous because they're not trying to be anything else but themselves. Does that make sense? Like they're absolutely. just- So I submitted one of the, actually it's my least favorite one of the series and I had to fill a wall. So I, I, I submitted it and I actually submitted it to you guys as well because of that. Um, and you showed it, it's, um, I actually don't even remember the name of it because I have to look it up because I'm that far, so far detached from it, I guess. Yeah. Um, but I have it, it's, it's called In Other Words, not that one, not that one. The other one on canvas, that one. Okay, right, right. Um, and, and that's kind of how I feel about that piece. And um, I have it hanging by a chair in my in my living room because all I do is paint it in my head over again. Right, isn't that great? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not sure yet how to solve its problems, but right, right. that is kind of, that is, this is an example, I guess, for me of a piece that's missed the mark. I got sidetracked. It was going along its way, you know. Right, then... right. But the, the good thing is, like you said, and I, I want to open it up to, we have a couple of minutes left for some questions. I'm sure there's some people that have great comments, but um, I, think, I think the two things are, you know, you, you kind of, the way you phrased it was you took an easy path or you took this, well, first of all, you didn't, we know that now, right? So you have this, side of your nature that's kind of fearless right because you don't take that job if you're not kind of fearless you know um that's not like a job that I'm a, I'm a pretty tough person i think i couldn't do that job you know so um the fact that you did it for so long it wasn't like you took a year and did it as some whim you did it and you stayed with it but i think the fact that you were in that studio 
your studio this morning and that mark making started to just kind of, you know, sometimes these things happen, you know, at the right moment, you know, and, and your mark making wanted to kind of assert itself out of the box, you know, and, and let, let, let me have a life of my own, right? We're talking, you know, we want our kids to be something. And then there's time comes a time when our kids are like, Hey, I'm not what you thought I am. I'm different. You got to let me have this life of my own and don't be so controlling of me. I'm going to do okay. Let me just get out there and do it, you know? And I think a lot of times the painting painters that I like, they're not so controlling about, like they, they get to a point when they're, you know, they're, they're very good. They know what they're doing, but they're, they allow that, that breath and that unexpected thing to happen in there, you know? And it transcends like just looking like art, you know, it, it has that moment, you know? And, um, but listen, let's act, let's ask, uh, there's some great, this great um, conversation. Daniel, can we go to a couple of these comments? Yes, um, sorry, the box comes up when I have my chat open and I share my screen. It took me a little too long to figure that out. <laughs> That's okay. All right. Um, let's see some of the comments. I just saw some from Brian and, um, right. yeah, it looks like, um, Brian and Angela said they really enjoy the one where you think you missed your mark. Yeah. See. And, um, let's see. Um, Maho, I believe if I'm pronouncing your name right or wrong, I'm sorry. Um, they said that it's a great idea that you're comparing other established artists with what you're talking about in the discussion. Um, and Matt said um, the two bodies of work to him, the canvas on paper, they're both beautiful, um, but your hand is softer on the paper, a quieter voice, and it's very elegant. Um, and then Annette did have a question. Um, she was back when we were talking about the gold color, asking if it had a special meaning to you. Um, to her, it reminded her of the Japanese art, um, Kintsugi. Oh, um, where right, you right. Replace the cracks with the gold and repair it with like the resin. And then you have a whole new work created in that way. So um, Stephanie, did the gold have any special meaning to you in your works? That's um, a great point. Um, and, and, and a little different than than I I get to mess up the pronunciation because I always do Kintsugi, but um, for me it's kind of um, it, it it's unmalleable, it's hard, um, it's metal, it's the opposite of paint, and I I like the disruption that it causes. Um, I also kind of like the challenge of it. I feel like to balance it and and maybe. Um, I don't, you know, sometimes it doesn't work out, um, but the challenge of balancing it, the hard and the soft kind of going back and forth from it um, is interesting to me. Um, I like how it messes with your, not messes with, that's a bad word. I like how it shifts your focus because as light hits it from different angles, it changes the way that you view the painting. So I like the kind of mystery that comes with it, um, but it can be very frustrating. Uh, because it's gold leaf and it can be kitschy and it can be crafty and it um, there was a while I was working with some textiles too but I broke my wrist and it made it hard to sew for a while and I just haven't gotten back into it not that I don't want to but I was sewing into the work and I and um, and I it kind of started becoming a replacement for that for me um, and and uh, and I kind of go back and forth sometimes I think it has a voice and sometimes I think it doesn't sometimes I me, you know, don't always listen very well and then kind of have to figure that out. Um, sometimes I think it's the right choice and it's not. Sometimes I leave it out and I probably may have, you know, I should have put it in, for example, in that piece that I was talking about that I feel like I missed the mark. I often wonder if what I need to do is is consider using another media like like a gold leaf or or like a stitch or something in it, but I don't want to do that just to cover up a mistake like whiteout. So I, I'm trying to avoid it for now. 
Tucker had a great comment, Danielle. Yeah, um, Kit said, when working on a larger piece, do you pause over an extended period or complete it all at once? Pause. I pause. I, I so I work in, in in layers, but I work pretty cyclical. So, um, well, I can show you. So this is the beginnings of one. Okay, I don't know if I can show. I'll try. But this is the. Can you see that? Because I can't see you anymore. I love the yeah. scale of it. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Um, <laughs> but um, so I work in layers. Um, and I kind of work all over the place and I do, I let them rest because, um, well, A, the paint needs to dry um, before I can work back into it. Um, I do like working wet on wet, but I also like not working wet on wet. Um, I tend to work with some pretty saturated colors um, so they can, they can turn to some unattractive mud. And sometimes if I don't give it a second, um, cool. But yeah, I do. I, I say, you know, I, uh, two to three months usually is what a painting takes. And I usually work on, well, like right now I'm doing one, two, three, four, five on canvas. And then one, two, three, four, five on paper. I do like the scale of it when you held it up. I wasn't aware of how, you know, I, I, I didn't see the sizes down here, so. Oh, they're big. I, I do like it because it definitely relates to the body for me, which is nice about abstraction. I like abstract works that are, that definitely relate to a physical size, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, some of the small works on paper are beautiful, but I do like the larger ones that relate to you as a, as a physical, because when you're doing the mark making, you're, you know, your, your facility, as far as your movement of your arm and your body, it's not just this contained thing. It gets a little bit bigger, which is nice, you know? Um, so I used to work a lot more in acrylic paint for a variety of reasons, one being space um, and being able to store paints, paintings as they dried. Um, but, um, and I kind of go back and forth, but I, I, cause I like to get into the painting and I'm only like five feet tall. So most of my paintings have some di you know, dimension that's about five feet, um, which is kind of nice because it's also, you know, as far as I can, my wings right, right, right. So I can carry it still, but. <clears throat> so the whole thing, one more thing, because I'm, I'm so happy that I got that bug reference out. What, what did the whole bug thing? I know Becky, I'm just touting my, I'm patting myself on the back, stop. No, I'm, I want to go back to that because, uh, you know, you hear you have this delicateness going on, but then you're talking about this parts of bugs being referenced, right? I, I have a thing. I don't know. I'm always been fascinated by bugs. I think they're so interesting. They're so pure and they just kind of do their thing. Um, I have a piece. One is of a wasp's nest. I got like completely fascinated with wasps. Um, and, and specifically, you know, the female wasp and, uh, then I, the scarabs, I've got a whole slew of, of beetle photographs on my, my, I have like a little board that I use to kind of keep papers it gets a little messy in here. So at least that way, I think I know where they are. Um, I don't know. They're just cool. They're interesting. They're, they're, they're like no bullshit. They do their thing. Hey, there it is right there. I mean, you got life and death on a quick life cycle, right? Their life cycles are so short, right? And then mm -hmm. their, the, their line, the line of their, you know, their, their biomechanics is absolutely beautiful. You know, their wings and their legs. And so there is this real kind of drawing like elegance in them, you know? But then um, I think when you start to take their, the gesture of their, you know, parts and you take it into a larger scale, it gets beautiful, you know? Mm -hmm. So maybe that's something you're, I don't know, maybe that's something you're investigating. So it's interesting. It's interesting that you're, but listen, I, I don't know, Becky, what do you think as we wrap this up? What do you, any well, last I, comments I, for Stephanie? Yeah, or? No, I had a question for Kit actually. Okay. Uh, kind of out of left field here. Um, but do you have a way of going back to Alaska? I mean, is it something you all do pretty regularly? Um, we haven't been in a few years only because we came back to Florida to care for my parents. Um, they passed away recently. So um, now we have grandchildren that live here in Florida. So I don't see us going back to live, but we, we would probably travel again, um, either in the Midwest or in Alaska again, only because I have friends there. Okay. Yeah. I was just curious on the, you know, chances of you going back in and 
you know, possibly shooting some of these people that you were talking about. I yeah. love that idea. I really do. And I'm glad you shared that because I think that could be part of the book. I would definitely encourage that as well. Yeah. Thank you. And Kit, we have one more question for you. I know that we got some of the social media from Stephanie, but do you have any social media or website that um, any of our other guests can check out for you? My blog is called Wash Ashore Alaska dot block blogspot.com nice. and it's all one word wash ashore alaska okay at blogspot.com uh -huh. okay. yeah wash ashore is uh -huh. actually a reference for people in the northeast but i adopted it when we went to alaska just because i loved it oh great and i had a quick question for stephanie um you know i had posted about whether she went back to her body of work, because I do that with my paintings, is I may leave something for a year and go back to it. And then I find that it has a completely different look and feel and emotion because I've changed my emotion and my outlook, you know, about something or the direction that I was going in. So do you find that to be true for your work as well, that something could completely change focus? I do. Um, and, you know, so I think about this a lot and I can't remember where I read it. And I feel like it may have been Glenn and Melton who had written it in, in Untamed, but it could have also been Elizabeth Gilbert and Big Magic or maybe no, but none of those. But I think those two. But, but uh, they were talking about uh, sharing your story before you've had a chance to finish, finish making it. Right. So um, oftentimes, like, you know, is people will will share our stories before we're ready to and, and at your detriment and I wonder a lot about that when I paint because I'm I'm constantly like thinking like my paintings are active thoughts and I wonder about that if I'm sharing my story before I've had a chance to finish the story sometimes so I do um I, I don't think I have the attention span to leave them for a year I wish I did but I don't think I do um I'm a, I think I'm a little too um what's the word, petulant, um, about things like that, but I probably should. Um, but, but that's, a, that's a, I, I think one of the things that I would, you know, critique about myself is perhaps I don't allow the story to kind of unfold fully before starting to paint it. And I wonder, I, I, I'm not saying that it's a bad thing, but I wonder what it would be like to be more reflective on a specific instances or specific things like maybe a bug or, or whatever it might be or a rock as opposed to kind of actively processing it well i think the whole thing about abstract painting is it's it is the active process of things happening at that moment right does that make sense yeah it's like it's not really i mean even though abstract painting has made reference to memory a lot like it's hearkening of different memories or drawing on different memories it is that immediate act of interacting you know with mark making and interacting and interpreting what you're feeling at that moment right that's the whole right. thing is, you know um i would just i would just kind of build on that and, and the thing of of layering like you know of going back and um like you said like you you had like a reference to like a pothole with bricks and then the next layer was tar or whatever right and the, the tar fell away and exposed the bricks you know but what I'm trying to say is just be in that moment and then go back and return to a, a, a work, but don't, don't think about the first, don't really think about the first layer, layer too much and just react again in that moment and see how those two things, when you step away, how they interact, you know, cause you're going to be unconsciously, there's going to be something that you're doing there. You know what I mean? But don't, don't be actively trying to tell a story. Because we, we all haven't finished our story yet. You know, even people that have thought about that, you know, we're all living the story as we're telling it kind of thing, you know. Um, uh, like even Becky's historical type photos of, you know, like these kind of vintage camera processes, they always appear like they're commenting to me on something new too. You know what I mean? Like this this new thing or this thing that we can that they were sh experiencing in that time and we're still experiencing it now, you know? So, um, yeah, I just, I, I love the feeling that you had that experience to me. I just, in the, in the studio this morning, I think it goes back to like allowing, you know, and, and you know what, sometimes we, 
we don't want to allow that side that's not perfect out. But there's a voice there that if we let it out and we step back from it and look back, we're like, oh, wow, it's it's actually saying something, you know, it's saying something, you know. So um, it could be very interesting. It could be interesting, you know. So, well, listen, Stephanie, do you have any questions or comments before we wrap up or? No, I'm, I'm very grateful for this. Uh, this was amazing. Oh, good, good. Well, listen, I, we, we, I, I'm so thankful for both of you. Both of you are really courageous and, you know, it's not easy to have your work evaluated and um, for you to be, you know, out there and, and be willing to take, you know, some comments and people will look at your work uh, for the first time. And while it's real time happening, that's, that's kind of a crazy thing, but we, we really appreciate you guys being willing to do it. You know, hopefully this is something that maybe we can revisit in a, in a wild time and see how things have progressed. That would be a kind of an interesting idea, you know? Um, I, 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 my last thoughts, I, I really want to see these people in Alaska now. That's kind of like, I'm like, oh my God, I want to meet these people and see them. And, and as far as Stephanie, I want to see that like crazy imperfect Mark that came out of nowhere and was like telling that whole story of life and death all on its own, you know? So, um, uh, I think the, the autism thing, I think these unconscious, we, those choices, um, I think there's really something in that that is going to take a lot longer to figure out than just tonight, you know, because that, that whole thing of wrestling with, you know, that, you know, nonverbal communication is, it's such a profound thing, you know, and, and the fact that it relates so much to abstract painting, I don't think there's a mistake there, you know, so, um, Becky, anything to say? Yeah. You know, we started off by saying how important it was to have conversation with other artists. And I think we really kind of hit that home tonight in that when both of you started talking about truly from the heart, what you felt your work was about, right. it was different than what you had actually written on paper. So, you know, I would encourage people to really engage in conversations about their work with other people. I mean, don't be afraid to say, you know, this is about the death of something, or this is about this or the change of whatever, because it's gonna help focus you on truly, you know, that basis of what your work is rooted in. Um, and I think we kind of saw that with both of you tonight. Yeah, you know, absolutely, yeah, yeah. You could, you, you know, as a spectator, you could see a different tone in your voices and your body language when both of you started talking in those two different areas. hundred percent, hundred percent. So, you know, I, I had this, um, just, just quick, you know, it's funny. We, we had an artist in residence, um, at, at Maitland and, um, he did these found object sculptures where he, he stacked up these found objects into these kind of sculptures that existed for a moment. They weren't fabricated or built. They were just these little stack things that he would photograph. But there was all this stacking of random objects. Like, and I had to do an artist talk with him. And so I'm like, I, I really try to do my homework. I don't want to do a disservice to anybody. So I just started reading all this stuff online about him. And right before I gave up, I saw this one obscure interview that he gave like five years ago where he talked about, this was him, not, I'm not talking out of school, this was him opening up about it. But his mother was a, uh, a hoarder. She had a, a mental, like a, a problem, like a, you know, and, and um, it got so bad that it affected the whole household and like, and all the, her, his whole house, he said, was these stacks of random objects. And I was like, oh my God, there's the gold mine right there, you know, and so, and he was he was really courageous to talk about it. And when I brought it up, you know, in the in the in the talk, people were like, oh my God, like, because it wasn't something that I like I, I asked him, you know, this is something that he had, you know, information that he had was forthright with. But what I mean is that was that was the uh, Rosetta Stone to understanding his work. And if I didn't find that one interview, I would have missed the whole thing. Because it wasn't really on the appearance of just conceptual art of trying to make conceptual art he was processing something that a trauma that he had gone through in his childhood and until i found that one interview where he was opened up and talked about it all the other stuff online about it didn't mention it so it was really interesting to me that like that that one
thing was really gave me insight into what his work was all about, you know, so. But, uh, but listen, thank you so much for everybody. Danielle, thank you so much. You've been great. Kit and, and um, Stephanie, thank you so much for everything. Thank you. We hope you came away with something tonight from your experience. Absolutely. Okay. Very, very helpful. Becky, you're a rock star. You too, bud. Thanks for changing shirts so we didn't look alike. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Brian and Angela and Sharon and everyone else out there, I love you and Matt Larson and be well and be safe and hopefully we can do this again. Oh, Danielle, do you want to mention what's going on in two weeks or three weeks? With our yeah, artists and yeah. residents? Yeah. Um, yeah, on the 16th, um, two weeks from now, we're doing a, um, a virtual um, usually they're in their studio but it's a studio conversation with our current artists and residents nelly appleby um so it'll be another free um program on zoom where dan will be talking with her about her really unique process with cyanotypes um so like the um really cool sunlit prints um and we're gonna be posting that soon and we have like a video of a sneak freak of her a sneak peak of her process. Um, so that'll be all the same way. And we hope that you will join us then. And then we are planning on having another um, critiquing conversation in April. And um, it'll either be virtual or in person. Um, but we'd love to have you all join us for that one as well. So thank you all for joining us tonight. Everybody be safe. Thank you. Bye. Thank all. you. Bye. Thank, thank you. you.